Hello, hello. Thank you very much for the introduction. And let me start this with a small round. As you can see, this paper has been written by Amir, who is one of our PhD students, and he couldn't make it today, so he asked me if I could take on his part. And you know why he couldn't make it today? Because he couldn't get a visa into Schengen. He is living in the UK since four years, just transitioned from a student visa to a work visa, and it takes these suckers six months to process a simple decision like this, because he could have decided to become a terrorist. So if you think that global policy doesn't really affect us in our ivory tower, look at me. Now you have to deal with this old croak <laughs> giving Amir's presentation instead of having a young, enthusiastic PhD student who actually implemented this work. So my plea to you is maybe not a political bias, but to take responsibility. What can we add to politics? Well, there is maybe nothing out there which you want to vote for at the moment, but what we can perhaps add is what we do in our daily lives. Evidence-based science is what we do all the time. Is politics currently evidence-based? I don't think so. So let's, let's add a little bit of contribution. We claim to be the smartest people in the world. Let's contribute to the world and put evidence out into the current decision-making. Go out and teach your friends, your colleagues, your students a little bit about politics and how politics should be done in the current environment. So let's, let, let's talk a bit about more interesting things than politics, perhaps, which is reinforcement learning. And you haven't seen a, a lot of reinforcement learning at this conference yet. In fact, none. This is the first paper. And you might have all seen these kind of um, scientific works in the past where very, very smart people designed artificial agents playing Atari computer games. And uh, currently, these are all on the leaderboard, so no human has been able to actually beat them. There is the very, very prominent AlphaGo playing. But when we looked at these videos, well, what we, what we noticed is that looks very similar to what actually our radiologists do when they look for a specific landmark, for example, for a specific plane, for a specific task in their daily life. And we thought, well, let's just try the magic of reinforcement learning on uh, medical image analysis tasks. Brief recap. So we haven't also heard a lot about unsupervised learning, but as you know, unsupervised learning is a method that tries to explore unlabeled data and to find hidden structures in the data on its own. Supervised learning, this is what we do in our daily lives. We have a set of expert labeled data sets. We build a machine, process all of this data, and hope that good results and potential money comes out on the other side. And reinforcement learning is slightly different. Actually, it's a computational approach to learn interacting with an environment. So it's something in between unsupervised and supervised learning. The overall goal is to maximize the final reward. And in my opinion, what makes reinforcement learning very nice in the context of machine learning at the moment is that you can formulate a lot of problems in an iterative and potentially human understandable way. So you can formulate reinforcement learning as a sequential decision-making process where, with tiny steps, I come a global goal closer and maximize my reward. And the mat mathematicians amongst you, even if you have no reinforcement learning experience, will immediately see, well, this is actually a Markov, Markov decision process. And Markov decision processes can be optimized to find the, the, the optimal path. So my goal is to find the overall optimal path to specific final, final goals, so to maximize these rewards here. I don't really understand Amir's logic to have a lollipop in between here for the baby, but uh, this would be the optimal path. And I want to make this decision at any step, at any stage of, these, uh, of, this, uh, of this process. So reinforcement learning in general is defined as a set of states so any agent can be in a state, the state can have a quality, and a set of actions. Actions lead me from one state to another state, and actions can, of course, also have qualities. Actions come with a reward signal. 
This is up to me to define. Uh, do I get closer to, to a desired final goal or, or further away? We usually deal with some Markov uh, assumptions, so this is a memoryless process. I can't really uh, assume too much memory. In reality, of course, we, we integrate some memory in here and learn from previous experience, but what becomes kind of tricky is looking into the future to uh, estimate the final reward on, in the course of my whole um, process. So. There is a lot of different terminology in reinforcement learning, but uh, really the key to understand is what we try to optimize, and this is the policy. So my agent lives in an environment where the agent might want to move or optimize a game or so, and, and gets constant input about this state. And what we want to optimize is the policy to what to do with this input. So how? to make a decision based on the information I have uh, about my, my state and the possible actions I can take. And for that, I essentially just need, as I just mentioned, the reward signal, but something that's very important and maybe the key to understand, which is a value function. And the value function can be defined in several different ways. I can define a value of a specific state I am. I can def define a value for any action I want to take. I can define uh, a value of a combination of a state of action, what's, what's, what's the kind of most reward-optimizing action I can take here. But the key to understand is I'm not just optimizing the best possible next action with the maximum reward. I'm always aiming for the final reward, for the final maximum value of all the accumulated rewards on, on my path. So I try to look a bit in the future, and this makes the whole thing tricky because I can't, I can't really find this path here immediately from, from this state, or from this state here even. So, uh, as usual, I need to approach this with some iterative solutions, and there is quite a lot of work out there uh, about how to design this kind of reinforcement learning algorithms, and one very uh, recently becoming very popular one is Q-learning, and the Q stands basically for quality, and the quality is exactly what I just described here as uh, the value function in my system. So the value function is defined as predicting the expected, and now special terms, accumulated discounted future reward function. What does discounted mean in this context? Well, uh, usually, as I just said, I can't look that far in the future, so I would put in some weighting factors to model this uncertainty of future predictions. So basically, what's closer to me, closer in the future, I want to um, upweigh a little bit. And what we usually optimize here is a state action value function. So based on, I want to know the quality of the current state I am I'm in, plus the possible actions I can take in this state, dependent on the environment I'm in at the moment, subject to the possible reward I can get. This is what I basically try to uh, optimize during training. Now, you're asking where is the deep in this whole reinforcement learning exercise? Well, here it comes. Deep learning uh, plays an essential role in estimating and approximating this value function by using deep neural networks to basically estimate from the current environment uh, the possible actions and the qualities of the possible actions that will optimize my final reward function. And that's basically what I try to optimize. So note here, this is really looking for the, the overall accumulated reward function plus the current improvement of reward with the current action. So we can just end-to-end -end optimize this using stochastic gradient descent usually. This has been explored in the medical imaging community quite a while ago for image segmentation. Uh, we also looked a bit recently into image localization. Now, landmark detection is maybe one of the more obvious ones. This is something radiologists do all the time. Uh, it has been done for image registration also very recently, and if you go to Mika, you can also see a derivative of, of this work for automatic scan plane planning, which you might implement in your, in your MRI scanner. This work is specifically for landmark detection, 
And we have evaluated a few of the current available um, architectures and, and deep and reinforcement learning approaches. We made a few tweaks, and I'll just show you the experimental evaluation in a, in a moment. So how did we design our reinforcement learning environment? Well, our environment is basically a small cube around the current state position. So it's a position and a cube of a specific size subsampled from, from our medical volume. And the possible actions are left, right, up, down, forward, backward. And these actions need to be rated with qualities now. One, one thing which is maybe a bit unusual in reinforcement learning, you also need to tell the agent, the agent needs to know at some point when the final goal is reached. And this you usually do with a terminal state, so there are two ways to model a terminal state. One is to just add another action to your CNN. This makes your CNN slightly more complicated, but can be quite effective if you have um, um, if, if you have more oscillating properties in your, in your data, or you look for just oscillating properties, does, does my agent start to move around a specific point, so I need some memory, some history in here, then I might also want to stop. So in contrast to some previous work, we, we actually chose in this terminal state the lower quality action to take, this just allows us to stay closer to the landmark than maybe popping out a bit. So this, this gains a little bit of more accuracy. And, and we usually also use this oscillating property to, to define the actual output state to keep complexity of our network small. The key uh, which makes our current approach slightly better than what's out there is that we have a larger receptive field and a multi-scale agent. So we start with a larger receptive field, uh, down sample to the CNN's uh, input size, and, and start from moving there to a terminal state, then reducing the size and, and, and find terminal states on the way. And we also have hierarchical action states, so if you're farther away, then it makes more sense to go larger steps. This is how our CNN looks like. We usually use a common uh, Strategy of, of four input volumes, so this is a history of the last few four steps, pushed it through our network, and then we get the quality of the six possible steps. And this is, again, the quality that might lead to maximum final reward. The reward function is simply modeled as the Euclidean distance, so the improvement of Euclidean distance from one step to the next step. And uh, we also implemented some more recent uh, DQN variants, so there is, a, there is something called a double DQN, won't go into detail with these, or the dueling DQN, which, which use some tricks to reduce basically complexity in the Q-value approximation function, so the CNN basically. Now, let's have a look at the experiments. We had, uh, we tried with the toughest data sets we could find, and as we all know, <coughs> ultrasound is quite uh, tough for medical image analysis problems, but it's pretty common in ultrasound to find landmarks like in these fetal scans, the uh, cerebral landmarks to do any kind from registration to de derivation of biomarkers. So we used 72 fetal head ultrasound scans, 3D head ultrasound scans, 21 for testing and 51 for trainings, and, and we tested for three landmarks, and, and that's the basic result. Of course, ours is better even without any tricks. Ours is slightly better because we have a better, a larger receptive field than was, what was presented last year at Mikai. Uh, but if you also throw in uh, the multi-scale approach, multi-scale actions, multi-scale hierarchical receptive fields, then you can actually get to quite good results when it comes to localization accuracy. Now this was the good, now comes the bad and the ugly, because how do you decide which of these architectures or approaches to use? And unfortunately, our experiments turned out to be dependent on the landmark we look at. So depending on your environment, how you define your environment or the landmark you, uh, you're looking for, you might find that variants of these uh, DQN algorithms will perform with different uh, performance. So this is how uh, an agent looks for, 
for a point, so this is the multi-scale approach. Uh, this, the set plane is, is moving in this direction. There is this red dot which gets smaller if we get closer in set, and the rest is, of course, x and, x and y. So we tried that also on more common data sets, something like brain MRI from the ADNI database. We used 832 isotropic one millimeter scans from this database, 728 for training and 104 for testing. We used very common points, the anterior and, anterior and posterior commissure points, uh, and, and had a look there. We are also pretty good in this, but again here, depends on which landmark you look for to define or uh, to find the best performing approach. So this is how the, the agent looks for, for these two points. It's moving slightly until, until it's there. What's my time? Okay. <laughs> We also did an experiment on, on cardiac MRI. Very common is to find the apex. Uh, you usually plan your further views on, on the apex. So um, we, let it, we let it loose on this one, on 455 short axis cardiac MRI scans with a 125 resolution from the Digital Heart Project. We used 361 for training and 91 for testing. And also here <coughs> we can <coughs> We find the same results. They perform differently, all perform reasonably well, um, and find the apex within, within a reasonable amount of steps. So this, is, this is just double DQN versus, versus dual DQN. In this case, the dual DQN is slightly better. So runtime, you asked. Uh, this is an iterative process. How long does it take to evaluate each, each uh, value function? Not too long, it's a millisecond usually. So you can find your landmarks within, within less than a second. All of the examples I showed you so far were, were just uh, slowed down for illustra illustrative purposes. In reality, it's about half a second, a bit more than half a second to find in a reasonably sized 3D volume any landmark you trained it for. So challenges, of course, noise, ultrasound data. If you change your noise too much, domain adaptation is still a huge problem for reinforcement learning as well, uh, as well as, as this terminal state. So this is, I think, always the biggest problem or one of the biggest problems in reinforcement learning. When do you stop to actually search? The agent needs to independently make this decision. There is no supervisor. So uh, it, might, it might sometimes lead to wrong uh, non-terminal state decisions. Uh, so reinforcement learning is a quite difficult problem. The trickiest part in training is to make sure that it doesn't overfit your training paths. If you don't carefully balance this, then you might just train a classifier that always well, uses one particular path it observed in the training data and not really take your environment and your current environment uh, into account. So it's a bit hard to make these things really data invariant. But um, our results definitely show that uh, the target landmark basically defines the environment. The environment defines which architecture performs well. All of them perform reasonably well, but it's a little bit hard to tell this is the one, the one approach you should use in, in, this, in this context. So as I said, fast reinforcement learning agents are possible, also for medical image analysis. I'm in particular thinking about maybe human-in-the-loop approaches, where you have uh, real-time requirements and, and something that helps you to make decisions and navigation options. Uh, we showed that several DQN strategies show similar performance. Multiscale, op multiscale had definitely an impact, a significant impact, so they, they seem to perform better if they see more in the beginning. Uh, uh, than if you would just start with a randomly small environment and hierarchical action steps speed up your whole convergence process. So there's lots of future work. We will not stop here. We will maybe explore a bit more uh, in direction what, what Google did with the AlphaGo approaches where you put the human in the loop and learn from the human this decision making and, and refine your environment based on whatever parts you're, you're in in the moment, so experienced operators 
will definitely not be replaced by approaches like this, but uh, will perhaps get a pretty useful body for doing uh, interventional procedures, for example. So that's it from my side. Uh, thanks a lot to a lot of people who are involved. Thanks to the NVIDIA guys. All of that has been done on NVIDIA GPUs, which have been kindly donated from NVIDIA. And if you want to test that, either scan the QR code or Amir's GitHub repository is openly available, and you can start to experiment with your own DQN uh, approaches, which is basically the first DQN medical image analysis framework that's freely and openly available to the community. So thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Are there any questions from the audience? I see one back there. Hello. Uh, hello. I would like to know why you didn't use uh, A3C? Why doing with DQN? Because I might have had a similar experience uh, yeah. uh, as you, but I would like to hear what's your take. So the question is why not using ectocritic approaches by using Q learning? The simple answer is memory. So on the GPU, the limited memory just restricts you with histories, and, and I think the ectocritic approaches need slightly more, more memory here. And we also looked into this in the beginning, but decided then that the DQN approach seems to be more appropriate and more feasible, but there is nothing that would speak against trying an AC approach for, for, for similar steps like landmark detection. Okay, very cool. And uh, for what concerns uh, you were talking about uh, maybe doing a kind of imitation learning, putting an expert in the loop, uh, for this kind of, don't you find that for this kind of problem of landmark uh, yeah. localization, uh, you, uh, learning from experience is kind of weird because uh, humans would uh, use a certain path, yeah. but that path is not unique. Yeah. So there might be many, many other paths that could be fine. So learning from experience doesn't really make sense. Yeah, so the question is, does learning from experience like in AlphaGo make sense in this setting? And, and I would say strongly yes, because there are two points. So the first point is perhaps I want an auditable system and an interpretable system which follows a path like a radiologist would do it, an anatomically reasonable path. My reinforcement learning in the current setting, my agent might learn some hidden structure in the data which is smarter to follow than an anatomical path makes it very domain variant. Yeah? So if, this, if the noise or whatever changes in my scanner, then this will all be gone. And our only hope is that it learned a little bit of anatomical knowledge. A radiologist will always have their anatomical model in their head and follow these kind of anatomical structures. So that way, we can make sure that these approaches kind of do a reasonable thing and make it more, more audible. And the other, the other part is if you have a, a real-time setting, or ENA setting, an emergency setting, where these parts become more relevant and quick decisions need to be made, then uh, usually you benefit from somebody who has hidden knowledge. They couldn't maybe even describe, so maybe I can extract even more knowledge from highly experienced experts that way. So, so for me, it makes a lot of sense to integrate them. If, it, if your only goal is to find in one specific modality from one scanner this one landmark, then you don't need a human in the loop. Otherwise, I think this is the future. OK, we have one more question over here. So I found it, as you said, very unsatisfactory that, sorry, here, ah. uh, that uh, the uh, results, uh, that the best model is a different one for every experiment. A mm. um, uh, uh, possible explanation that, that would be more satisfactory would be that the distributions are not well um, summarized using mean and variance. Uh, did you do any statistical significance tests for the differences? No. Yeah, that's, so the, 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 the comment is basically, it's a bit unsatisfying that, that our agents all di perform differently for different landmarks and if we did some significance analysis. Uh, no, not at this stage. That's definitely the, the one of the next stages we are, we are going to. But I, I totally agree. So, so the more satisfying answer for me would be a, a set of rules, maybe not only statistical testing, but a set of rules, how to decide on which kind of approach to use for what kind of environment, so how to parameterize our environment. But I totally agree. This is, this is not completely satisfying yet. Yeah. OK, we have time for one more question. I think I saw one here in the front. Uh, Maxi. 
um, very interesting approach. Have, uh, can you comment on um, how often or whether this happens at all, your algorithm gets stuck in really bad local minima which are far apart from the anatomic landmark because in radiology you know uh, making a little error of a millimeter for localizing the septum pellucidum doesn't matter but if it's really way off maybe at the other side of the skull mm. it really matters clinically so uh, that is the one part the, the second quick question if the intended target so the anatomic landmark you are aiming at is not in the data set at all because it's cut off uh, is that an, something that you have considered that your algorithm then kind of stops by recognizing that uh, it doesn't make sense to proceed? These are two very good questions. So the first question is if, if you have observed agents going really far off, so not only a few millimeters, but, but really far off, and the other one is, if I understood this correctly, can I learn an agent? to detect a landmark that is not in the training data. Yes. So if it's, if it's cut off or somewhere else, so, so really what I said to have this an anatomical knowledge. And so to answer the first question, we haven't really observed agents to go really far off somewhere. So what you usually observe, about what, what the biggest problem is you tackle is that, you, that, you, that you're getting stuck in a kind of minimum close to your landmark. So that ho happens quite a lot. It, it happens a lot if you, if you have a lot of symmetry in your data. Brain is obviously one of these, so that's uh, why we use the kind of mitral points. Uh, it would be a bit harder if you have ventricular points. But, um, but to go really off somewhere else, so I think the multi-scale approach will avoid this because as you can see in this example, it starts relatively big, so it should already see part of the landmark. And the other, the second question is a really, really good question. So can I learn uh, paths and not, not only landmarks? And I don't think in this current setting. So, so if your landmark is really not there, then you would, I mean, I think the only fallback option you would have is you define a landmark, the best possible closest landmark on this path. But if it's not there, I think no. So the agent would do, I don't know what the agent would do. An interesting future research path, probably. <laughs> probably, okay. yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I, uh, I think we have to conclude this uh, discussion with this. Let's thank the speaker one more time.